So there are different ways of stimulating the vagus nerve. The historical way, when I started to be very interested in this, was an implant of the vagus nerve. And in this area, you would you can see the small size of the vagus nerve that runs in the carotid sheath in the picture up on the right hand side here. And one would place the coil electrode around the vagus nerve, connect it to a pulse generator, uh, typically placed in the chest, and use that to, as a treatment for, in fact, epilepsy was the first one that was used. Um, much later, anxiety and depression, uh, would, it was used for anxiety and depression with that. Uh, approved by the FDA in about 2005 for that. There's an auricular nerve stimulator, which gets to about 2% of the vagal fibers that run through the neck. And of course, there's the uh, non-invasive cervical vagus nerve stimulator, uh, which is what I spent most of my time working on over the last 20 or so years. I'm going to briefly cover headache. And I uh, know that we're going to have colleagues from uh, the Cleveland Clinic cover this, so I will just do it very briefly. Uh, um, migraine is a tremendous problem. It's probably the number two pain problem we see in the United States or around the world. 18% uh, of women, 6% of men. Uh, our military population is actually significantly more uh, disabled by uh, migraines with the traumatic brain injuries. It can be as high as 80% of patients with traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress disorder also have comorbid migraine. And we don't really have great strategies for treating that. So um, we embarked a while back on trying to figure out why. And it's kind of an interesting story of how we got here. I was looking at a treatment for uh, my son who had peanut allergies in how we could block the airway reactivity in an asthmatic or a peanut allergic uh, person. And while we were studying that, we figured out that headaches went away. And we decided to try to figure out why that was and work with Mike Oshinsky, uh, who's now at the NIH, who looked at glutamate production, which is the most prominent excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. And it gets increases, and I'm not showing you that on this slide, but glutamate increasing in glutamate correlates directly with uh, ocular hypersensitivity or a model of migraine. And if you uh, so you can see that the gold bar is increasing glutamate after the animal is um, given nitroglycerin. You stimulate the vagus nerve even 90 minutes into it and you can block the production of glutamate or the existence of glutamate in the, uh, in the uh, trigeminal nucleus and it reverts almost back to a normal state here. So this is one of the mechanisms. A second mechanism was done up at Harvard where they looked at cortical spreading depressions. And you think about your patients with uh, migraines who have pain down, you know, may have a sensation going down their arm or may have a visual sensation or may have some other um, <clears throat> aura that comes up. And that is probably a cortical spreading depression, wave of electrical activity crossing the brain and vagus nerve stimulation slows the frequency of cortical spreading depressions Slow, uh, decreases the threshold, or I'm sorry, increases the threshold for cortical spreading depression and decreases the speed of cortical spreading depression. So altering the abnormal electrical excitability of the brain. An area that I thought was really interesting was that they also showed a change in pro-inflammatory cytokines. And I want you to think about this as I talk about the rest of the day of why vagal nerve stimulation and electrical nerve stimulation, more broadly speaking, can work on so many different disorders from pain to, from pain on to um, disorders such as a stroke or rheumatoid arthritis. It's this central mechanism of vagus nerve stimulation in modulating pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now, over the years, a number of studies have been done looking at this. There's the ACT-1, ACT-2, uh, studies that were done in the U.S. and the United, uh, and uh, and in Europe, looking at a randomized controlled trial of acute treatment of cluster headache, and what was identified in these studies that you could stop in a cluster attack within 15 minutes, about 50% of the time, on the on the paradigms we use today, by using vagus nerve stimulation compared to a sham device. So significant improvement, and there's really nothing that's got that effective out there uh, in treatment of cluster headaches. 
Um, prevention of cluster headache, you could block 50% of the cluster attacks coming on uh, by use of vagus nerve stimulation as well, and up to 48% of the time if they actually use the device. Migraines, um, acute treatment of migraine, the best study out there was the PRESTO trial, looking at can we uh, stop a migraine from happening within two hours, which was the American Headache Society criteria. And you can see here that it was statistically significant that within two hours, you could block a migraine from happening uh, um, abort the migraine uh, overall. Again, uh, highly uh, significant. Prevention of migraine, uh, a number of studies now are showing that we can actually prevent migraines. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but just to say in those patients with aura, and remember I talked about those cortical spreading depressions in the animal model, you could decrease the number of headache days, 5.5 days in this, uh, one study, um, which is, I think, better than most of the drugs out there in blocking um, migraine with aura or any of the medical devices out there and blocking migraines with aura. So again, a very highly uh, uh, statistical and clinically significant um, therapy. This was all covered in uh, the Pain Management Best Practices Task Force mandated by Congress which basically outlines that this is one therapy that should be considered in patients with chronic migraine. And multiple, this is uh, uh, effective because there are multiple different mechanisms. And I've set this up because now I mentioned that there were all these FDA approvals out there for um, um, migraines and paroxysmal hemicrania and hemicrania continuum and cluster headache, but it's based on multiple mechanisms of action, which is really quite interesting here. It modulates nociception. It's been shown to modulate the cortical spreading depression. It modulates uh, neurotransmitter uh, production. Uh, in, and I didn't show you this, but including CGRPs, glutamate, uh, norepinephrine, serotonin. And it modulates the autonomic nervous system, which has exquisite control over inflammation. Cr incredibly important for how we think about things uh, moving forward. And as we start thinking about us in society where we've been largely a drug society, I think, you can see the geese flying south for the winter here. And this one geese goose is up in the third window and he's, he decided to fly first class instead of going there. I think we need to think forward to other strategies and really think about new theories around this area. And I, I am of the opinion that our whole view of neuromodulation is right now in the midst of a paradigm shift where we're going to be using neuromodulation much more broadly and effectively than we have in the past. There are a number of different diseases that are being studied as you see here. Uh, I'm working on, I think, all of these different areas right now in some capacity, trying to use vagal nerve stimulation to modulate disease. And it's because I think we affect not all of these diseases, but we affect a common pathway that's central in all of these, which is the inflammatory pathway. Uh, an area that we've been, and that's because inflammation is so prevalent in Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, arthritic disorders, type two diabetes, autoimmune disorders, inflammation is centrally important. So can we turn off inflammation? Um, and the answer is we've been doing it for a long time and not even known that we've been doing it. I, I spoke at the World Institute of Pain about the observation that there are 12 to one glial cells to neurons in the uh, spinal cord where we've been doing spinal cord stimulation over the years. And uh, these glial cells are not just structural support cells, these glial cells control inflammation. And this inflammation is incredibly important. And uh, I won't go through this slide in detail, but the microglial cells, the astrocytes, the oligodendrocytes, and the neurons all change their protein production based on electrical stimulation. And in the pattern that um, uh, Ricardo Vallejo, who many of you know, was working on, he identified that you could return an animal that was uh, had an a, a injury model that was associated with pain back to a non-pain state by using electricity in a paradigm that he developed very close or much closer to normal in the microglial, the astrocytes and the 
uh, um, uh, oligodendrocytes, uh, then you could actually do, um, uh, and, and this was correlated directly with behavioral responses of pain. Very, very important. Now, how about with the vagus nerve stimulator? Um, if you're anything like me, the vagus nerve, when we uh, all got started, I got started in this a little over 30 years ago, and the vagus nerve was that structure I just knew I didn't want to hit when I was placing a central line. But the vagus nerve is probably the most important nerve in the body, other than maybe the spinal cord. Uh, it has control over, as you see here, cardiac tissue, pulmonary tissue, uh, the stomach, uh, the liver, uh, small intestine, and importantly, the spleen. And the spleen is not this structure that we can just take out willy-nilly, it actually uh, controls the inflammatory response. I'm gonna pause here a minute and just talk about inflammation just for a minute. Inflammation is incredibly important to us. We want to have an inflammatory response. If you have a bacterial infection, you want your tissues to go in, wall that area off and control a, a foreign body. But inflammation can be incredibly um, lethal as well. If you are exposed to peanuts and you're a peanut allergic person, it can cause problems. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, that's an inflammatory response. And because it, your body uh, is so exquisitely sensitive to inflammation and can be killed by inflammatory responses, it actually has four mechanisms of controlling inflammation. The circula circulating corticosteroids, which we all know about, the SOX proteins, which are suppressors of cytokine signaling proteins. There are anti-inflammatory cytokines. And what's less recognized by the general medical community is the autonomic nervous system also controls inflammation. And that's what I'm gonna spend a few minutes really just diving into this aspect of care, because look, this is what we do. We control, <laughs> we are the experts in the autonomic nervous system in the medical community today. So it's important that you understand what you're doing um, with this. I wish, I wish I could take credit for this, but I can't. This was developed by a guy, Kevin Tracy, who I personally believe will probably get a Nobel Prize for this work as it is so critically important. But he identified uh, and published in about 2000 that if you stimulate the vagus nerve through a reflex through the celiac ganglion, there is a branch that um, activates the T cells with noradrenergic uh, uh, compounds. And those noradrenergic compounds uh, cause a release of acetylcholine on the macrophages, those microglial-like cells, um, uh, via the alpha-7 subunit of the acetylcholine receptor. And this is what controls the inflammatory response. Now, I'm showing you here the, what's called the cholinergic anti-inflammatory reflex that goes to the spleen. It was the original one that was described, but there are multiple of these uh, reflexes. And the work that he did that was, I think, so groundbreaking um, was published in Nature in about 2000, uh, did, did a very interesting model. He took rats and he injected lipopolysaccharide. Uh, and if you inject lipopolysaccharide, for, first of all, if you do nothing to these rats, they don't have much TNF-alpha, uh, which is one of these pro-inflammatory cytokines at all on the, on the far left bar. You really see almost negligible TNF-alpha. If you come over to the second arm here, you inject lipopolysaccharide and don't do anything to the vagus nerve, you have a robust production of TNF. It's a um, very uh, profound response that you can see, and that can be actually uh, dangerous to, to you. If you cut the vagus nerve, you have an increase over that um, sham plus lipopolysaccharide. That's telling you that your vagus nerve always has some intrinsic control modulating and dampening down how much TNF is uh, produced in, in response to an insult. But look at the far right here. If you stimulate the vagus nerve after the animal has been given lipopolysaccharide, that amount of TNF alpha is cut about a, in a third from your intrinsic state. So, I mean, uh, cut down two thirds to about a third of what it had before a really a tremendous response that gives us a clue on how we can address clinical entities that are associated with inflammation. Uh, Emmanuel Lehrman took normal human healthy subjects 
and stimulated them and stimulated um, uh, uh, with them with lipid polysaccharide, stimulated their blood and took those same people and stimulated them with vagus nerve stimulation and showed you could block the inflammatory response in normal healthy controls. And that's important, but not as important as disease. Um, over the last 20 years, there's been a, 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 a robust study of this. With the implanted device, uh, there's a group called with Setpoint Medical, which is a medical device company that makes an implanted uh, micro vagus nerve stimulator. And they showed that you could decrease the um, production of TNF alpha with vagal nerve stimulation with an implant. Really interesting. On um, these are patients who with rheumatoid arthritis who failed conservative management. And you can see over time, this had a significant improvement in their DAS 28 scores. Uh, and that directly correlates with the vagal nerve stimulation. You turn off the vagus nerve stimulation at day 42, and you start to see an increase again of the TNF alpha. So it's doing something to block this production. And this is not ready for prime time. This is a scientific presentation we're talking about, but it really does lead uh, us to think about, well, maybe there will be um, <clears throat> uh, some avenue beyond medications in the near future that we can use for patients with rheumatoid arthritis. They did a, a, a follow-up uh, uh, in July of 2020, and I wrote a little piece in The Lancet about this uh, paper, which I thought was very good, uh, showing that this is leading towards a pathway uh, in an RCT around vagal nerve stimulation, looking at different doses. I'm not really going to dive too deeply into it. There's too much other going, stuff going on. Um, uh, a group uh, uh, out of the UK looked at Sjogren's disease. And the big problem the patients with Sjogren's have is fatigue. And they showed that with vagal nerve stimulation, you could improve IL-6, IL-1 beta, IL IP-10. And you can see here, and that also correlates highly with an improvement in fatigue. So again, highly interesting uh, clinical relevance. And we think about our fibromyalgia and our chronic fatigue patients, and maybe there's an avenue there. How about inflammatory bowel disease? Inflammatory bowel disease is relatively poorly treated. Um, and um, we can see here, I mentioned that the classic cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway was the spleen, but you can see here also a branch that goes down to the bowel as well. And there are in the bowel, um, the vagus nerve has direct impact on the mesenteric plexus, which modulates the macrophages, which modulates T cells and FOXP3 cells. FOXP3 is a good thing if you can increase it and that's what it does. And it depresses the uh, uh, T cell act action as uh, regulatory T cells. And that correlated in Bruno uh, Bonaz's uh, paper on active disease progression in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Now, again, he did this study in patients with an implanted device in patients who were failing all Me uh, mechanistic uh, approaches, and six out of seven of their patients had a significant improvement with vagal nerve stimulation. Interesting, um, in the model that he was using was an implant, and I think, interestingly, we probably can do a lot of the same things with a non-invasive approach. Um, work out of Emory University looked at post-traumatic stress disorder, a double-blinded, randomized crossover trial or uh, with long-term extension trial I'm just going to talk for a moment about the first three months of the trial in patients with post-traumatic stress disorder. This is an area that I've spent a lot of my time thinking about and trying to work with our wounded warriors here in the United States who have come back and they have uh, uh, a post-traumatic stress disorder. And he identified that he could take this population of patients and compared to sham, improve the autonomic scores, improve the PTSD checklist score, which is a, uh, a disease severity index, and he identified, interestingly, that you could block the production of IL-6. Thematically, I keep coming back to this. It's IL-6 overproduction is part of what's occurring in patients with PTSD. IL-6, you'll hear about in a moment, is what's killing people with COVID. Um, and uh, over a three-month period, also uh, significant improvement as well. So what he found was significant improvement in behavioral responses, um, neurobiology, and I'm not going in through all the autonomic aspects that he showed, but the IL-6 was really quite interesting. 
Parkinson's disease. Okay, I know I'm segueing between a lot of different things right here right now, but Parkinson's disease is an area where when we think about what we do, there are certain drugs that we can use and then we jump directly to deep brain stimulation, right? And um, a group also out of the UK and India um, looked at uh, vagal nerve stimulation in Parkinson's, a double blind randomized crossover trial with a 30 day washout period looking at function. And I draw your attention over to the left. The patients, um, first I should say, what kills people with Parkinson's? It's typically their gait. They ambulate, they can't turn quickly, they fall, they break their hip, and they, they die from consequences of that. And so what they looked at in this study was step length, velocity of step. They didn't really um, look at this, but I saw the videos of this. Is, you know, the ability to turn and, and do fine motor or gross motor movements of ambulation and turning and walking around. Um, and they also looked at stance time, improvement in stance time with this and clinically significant improvement. But what did I talk about? Those pro-inflammatory cytokines significantly decreased in patients with Parkinson's disease, highly correlated there. Glutathione, which you can think of as a scavenger of inflammation, increased. And uh, interesting, uh, BDNF, kind of a disease, index of disease was also improved. You want actually good BDNF, high BDNF, and that was significantly improved in active versus sham. So they're now embarking on a 100 patient study uh, as well to further delineate this. But again, really interesting on how our autonomic control and our ability to control the autonomic nervous system can actually make a difference. Now, um, I mentioned at the outside, outset that um, I was working initially on airway reactivity because my son had peanut allergies. And I had done a series of studies uh, in patients uh, with obviously with collaborators who are experts in asthma, looking at vagus nerve stimulation in airway reactivity. And we actually had some pretty good data that patients with airway reactivity could have a decrease in um, uh, bronchoconstriction, improvement in work of breathing with vagal nerve stimulation. And I just went through with you Kevin Tracy's work on blocking the cytokine reaction. And I, we knew at COVID that what was killing people, in fact, a work out, early work out of Wuhan, China showed that patients with an IL-6, I think it was greater than seven, or six or seven, had 100% mortality. Those who had an IL-6 of less than five all lived. So it's not COVID that was killing people, it was this cytokine reaction that was killing people. Um, and, um, and then we're on this with Rob Levy and my colleagues from um, uh, Electricor and George Yanakopoulos, an infectious disease specialist, on why I thought that vagus nerve stimulation would potentially be a good strategy for, for uh, COVID. And it was the two mechanisms, modulating that efferent pathway, which is the inflammatory response, and then modulating what is actually an afferent pathway with an efferent reflex on airway reactivity. Um, this was published in April of 2020. Um, and Carlos Tenero, and we got an FDA emergency use authorization um, based on the early work. Carlos Ternero from Spain did a wonderful study uh, called the Savior 2 st study published in uh, uh, this past April, I think it was, showing reductions in C-reactive protein, changes in procalcitonin, interestingly, <clears throat> improvement in D-dimer. The other thing that was killing people, as you all re remember, was blood clots. And that is probably a secondary effect of the inflammatory response. And you can see a trend towards improvement in D-dimers with uh, vagal nerve stimulation compared to um, uh, a standard of care. And when you know we're all surgeons, we all think a little bit about, did I get an infection? And I just arbitrarily use 10, as a CRP of greater than 10 would be abnormal, and looked at standard of care versus active, how quickly do we return people to less than 10, significantly better in the vagus nerve arm compared to 
uh, standard of care. Again, modulates inflammation. And breaking it down by mild, moderate, or severe, you can see that depending on where we caught it in the course of the disease, you had a trend towards improvement in TNF-alpha, IL-6, um, modulation of D-dimer, and overall C-reactive protein. So very, very interesting. I'm gonna dive into this a little more deeply on Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. Eastern. If you're interested, you can scan this document here. Um, I'm going to work, my, my big interest now is now on um, uh, long COVID. Well, I'm gonna cover some of the acute COVID stuff that I just talked about a little bit more in detail at this talk. We're gonna have Diana Barrent join me who is the founder of Survivor Corps. I work with uh, Diana uh, here in the United States and she has close to 200,000 patients here who have long COVID who are listening in and it's a patient advocacy group. She's gonna talk about how she got it started. Uh, the group at uh, um, the Cleveland Clinic in, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, it's the group at, at Mayo Clinic in, in Rochester is also gonna talk about the long COVID study that they're doing now, uh, looking at uh, vagal nerve stimulation for treatment of long COVID. And, and as it happens, I didn't actually read the paper. I got the paper last night on stellate ganglion blocks for long COVID, tremendous results. And you think about the autonomic nervous system and the yin and the yang here, we are used to blocking the sympathetic nervous system, but now we're thinking about activating the parasympathetic. And I think there's gonna be an opportunity to do both potentially down the road as we block the sympathetics, we activate the parasympathetics, and it may be our treatment of choice down the road for patients with long COVID. I'm gonna end with my thoughts on stroke. Um, now you probably are saying stroke, how could you possibly affect stroke? It's the same thing. Stroke remains um, the second leading cause of death in the United States, uh, around the world I, I actually. Um, um, one in 200 worldwide people are stroke sufferers. 35 million people globally have an acute stroke. We've got no new treatments in the last 25 years for stroke. Um, but vagal nerve stimulation in animal models was shown to decrease the size of the stroke. Take a look at the uh, uh, cross section of an area of the brain here. Um, you do a middle cerebral artery occlusion, you then uh, release that and you look 24 hours later to see what happened to the size of the stroke. And the animals that were treated with vagus nerve stimulation, if you get it acutely, had a much smaller infarct size than if you had um, uh, just a stand standard of care control arm. Uh, you have to catch it with, I'm gonna draw your attention to the, the bottom quarter here. You have to catch it within a quick time period. And the reason I think is that penumbra, the area at risk can be damaged by, you heard it, microglial cells and inflammatory response, but you gotta catch it early. So um, we worked um, with a group out of, uh, um, uh, Turkey, taking a look at this to see if we could prevent uh, this it's from Hasatep University, the group at Harvard, Mass General, uh, did a nice study that was presented at the International Stroke Conference this past February. And since it was already presented, I'm just going to tell you what they presented at uh, the Stroke Conference. They looked at sham versus low dose vagus nerve stimulation and high dose vagus nerve stimulation. And that high dose vagus nerve stimulation really amounts to 14 um, two minute stimulations over effectively um, a, you know, a five hour period there. So you stimulated, waited three hours, and then stimulated uh, again uh, in a protocol that they developed uh, for this. Looking at safety and it, uh, you know, cut to the chase, it was extraordinarily safe, but also taking a look at um, uh, looking at changes in infarct size, which I'll show you. They did a good job at stimulating within a few hours. And this was within five hours when last uh, witnessed well, um, or if they it was a witness stroke within four hours. And this was after they got a CT scan and assessed the type of stroke. And what they found was, if you take a look at this high dose model, the high dose vagus nerve stimulation compared to sham over here, Look at the increasing size of the stroke within 24 hours. It increased 185% versus 63% in the high dose vagus nerve stimulation arm. And so graphically, 
uh, that's the sham has an increase over time. And that's the penumbra that we all know about. That's why we follow these patients that you get an infarct size and then there's area at risk right around that area. <coughs> and then we, then we scan again, 24, 36, you know, you know, some number time period later. And you take a look at the size of the stroke growth and the low dose stimulation only increased 99%. I would be very happy with that. If you could decrease the size of your stroke 50%, wouldn't you be happy? Well, if they, did high, if they did high dose stimulation in this model, a small group of patients, I think this was 66 patients, um, they found that you could only, in, only increase the size 63%. Now, I'm just gonna end with a thought of those patients with um, um, clinical diffusion mismatch, um, those are people who presentation is not what you'd expect by looking at the imaging study. You see them, they don't look so bad. You get a CT scan, I mean, they look really bad. You get a CT scan, it's not so bad. That is a patient, which we call a CDM patient, hot clinical diffusion mismatch. And if you take a look at the size of the growth in that person, it was an increase in the infarct side of 245%. If you stimulated the vagus nerve in that group, it only increased 25%. So almost a tenfold difference, tenfold difference. I can't think of anything else that is that profound uh, in tissue damage uh, in that subpopulation of the patients. So um, this is, I think, my concluding slide that there is a number of things that are occurring uh, when you're stimulating the autonomic nervous system, the, in particular the parasympathetic, the vagus nerve stimulation. First of all, you modulate inflammation. If you haven't heard me say that today, uh, the autonomic nervous system controls inflammatory response. That also controls neuroinflammation and neuronal excitability. And all of these factors work together on a variety of different diseases. And we may, may have found a simple common pathway for various diseases. Um, we're looking at it, and, you know, this has been found to work now with spinal cord stimulation, I think also with vagal nerve stimulation. And I think we're looking at there might be a variety of diseases that are amenable to this uh, that could potentially give us an avenue for new treatment strategies that the pain physician in particular um, will be involved in in the future. Um, again, here's my Vegas Nerve Society. If, if I've intrigued you in any way, sign up. It's free. You'll get some good information. If uh, um, you're not interested, sign up anyway. Um, and you know about my long, our long COVID study that we're going to, a long COVID um, uh, webinar we're going to do on Wednesday. So thank you very much. And Sadiq, I look forward to Thanks chatting so with you. Uh, Thanks a lot, Peter. That was fantastic. I think, uh, you know, Sounds like we might have found, uh, we may have found a magic bullet, hopefully, in terms of vagal nerve stimulation. The amount of applications you told us is, uh, is really, really interesting to know how the autonomic nervous system plays an important role in, in the neural inflammation. Uh, so we have some questions. Uh, we'll start with, uh, we do have a, uh, a clinical medical student uh, on, 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 uh, with us. Uh, her name is Sarah Darwish. So Sarah writes, as a clinical medical student, how can we get involved in the research in this field? Do you have any comments on that, Peter, in terms of the vagal nerve stimulation? Are there any plans of the society running, running clinical trials in the various parts of the world where they can get involved? Do you have... Any, any comments? Yeah, so Sarah, what I would say, Sarah, is uh, I uh, put in the chat box my email at the outset. Drop me an email. Um, uh, it is my vision that we'll have funding at some point for the Vegas Nerve Society to be doing larger scale trials. But there are people looking at the Vegas Nerve Stimulator um, um, really around the world from various topics. And I, I, that early slide talked about the things that people are looking at. And what's really intriguing and fun for me is, I think I'm an expert in pain. I, I think I know about pain and I know a fair amount about neuromodulation, but I am certainly no expert in all of these different diseases, but people who are the top of their field are coming out of the woodworks and, and you know approaching uh, the Vegas Nerve Society and me personally, because I have some experience in this, because they've stumbled onto the fact as well that the vagus nerve controls a variety of different aspects. And this is an inexpensive uh, um, 
low risk approach for treating different disorders. So drop me a note and tell me where you live and I will um, uh, try to connect you with people who are working on these topics. And again, this is not this is part of the future of medicine in my view, and it creates an opportunity. So I think you're wise to get engaged now while you're young and enthusiastic and got a lot of energy and true. follow what happens over the years. That is true. So I think Peter has written his email address, peterstats at hotmail.com. Sarah, drop an email to Peter. I'm sure he'll help you out. Uh, Another question do we, we have here, Peter, in terms of uh, vagal nerve stimulation for demyelinating disease like multiple sclerosis. Have you come across any studies? Do you think there is uh, any role of uh, VNS for the, that kind of neurological condition? Yeah, I'm going to start with I don't have any specific um, studies on demyelinating disease like MS, but I would say we need to stop and we need to think about what people are doing for multiple sclerosis. Um, you may know, and it, it sounds completely unrelated at this time, but they're doing things like fecal transplants for multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people know about that, but that's kind of an interesting thing that people are doing. And you have to ask the question, well, why would you do that? And sure. this is, an observation of the gut brain interface. The fact is how does that information of the gut microflora change get to the spinal cord or the brain in areas of demyelinating disorders? Well, it's the vagus nerve. So I think there's reasons to think about that. And we also know that some of the demyelination is probably coming from an excess of inflammatory response. So we have that bit of information, but uh, it's not ready for prime time yet. And I think that's an area that's ripe for some neurologies. And I've spoken with a few neurologists about this who are interested in doing that work, but that's, that's, a, that's a challenging uh, thing to do. Uh, but it's probably a worthwhile thing to consider as a add-on you know, if you're treating a patient with gamma interferon, which is an anti-inflammatory, you it makes sense that something like this might be an effective therapy. I just don't have the data to say, yeah, this is a good idea or a bad idea. Um, and, and more work needs to be done there. Going on the same line, Peter, I think another question saying role of vagal nerve stimulation for autoimmune related myopathy and glomerulonephritis. I think you've already answered the question that if there are autoimmune conditions where, you know, there's a neural inflammation that's playing the role, then vagus nerve maybe. But yeah, a couple of more indications that might be research topics for future, I, I guess, you know. I, my guess is there's something out there because I asked Dr. Park to write a chapter for my next book on renal impact. Yeah. And uh, I haven't seen her book chapter yet, but my next book is coming out on vagus nerve stimulation. And we'll see what, what, what's known. Um, uh, shameless plug for my next book that will be out early next year. Right. And we have, uh, we have a question on the depression. We already answered about PTSD, but what about uh, kind of, you know, uh, clinical depression, uh, uh, Peter? Any role of vagal nerve stimulation in just depression rather than post-traumatic stress disorder? Yeah. So, so again, we don't have, uh, with a non-invasive approach, um, we don't have a, uh, an indication for that. Um, the CE mark was anxiety and depression, I believe, uh, based on um, the role, the, the FDA clearance that was originally received for severe depressive disorders with an implanted device. Mm -hmm. And I think they, uh, Medicare wanted to, uh, or required a continuing edit, uh, evidence development I think that study that uh, has it just about now wrapping up. So I think we're going to have some more clear information um, on an implanted device for depression. Um, and I'm thus, you know, I, I believe that there's mechanistically it makes sense. There's enough work with an implanted device that makes sense. And we, we just got to do some more homework on that one as well. So I think um, I'm sure patients would probably prefer doing a non-invasive non vagal stimulation for the depression rather than taking tablets with multiple side effects, right? You know, I think it will be, it will make- yeah, or surgery. 
yeah, those those are your those would be your op or you know and and look I'm I'm a big fan of cognitive behavioral therapy uh, I think that's an important aspect but sometimes we need an adjunct to this a lot of times patients uh, do need a bit of a push I think it's like jump starting the car where they need some help in terms of the medications or the device which will allow them to then participate or engage in the CBT and in the psychological kind of you know interventions so it makes sense right. Okay, I think uh, what I liked, Peter, is, you know, when you say two things, uh, the peanut allergy, uh, unfortunately, my daughter suffers with peanut allergy, and then I'll, I'll, I'll connect with you offline uh, in terms of use of this uh, for, for the airway reactivity in peanut allergy. But the second thing was the PTSD and, uh, you know, steelhead ganglion blocks. We've been doing them, and obviously there are, there are lots of centers, I think, that we've established in uh, in a veterans hospital in the US where they're teaching people how to do steel ganglion block for PTSD. And at the same time now we have a, a non-invasive device which actually uh, kind of, you know, stimulates the vagal nerve, a uh, vagus nerve in order to help with the PTSD. So uh, it's quite interesting to know how the, uh, as you said, yin yang, and I like the analogy, it's yin yang, where you either, uh, you know, doing a sympathetic semi or sympathetic blockade or you're stimulating the vagus nerve and, and, and uh, overpowering the parasympathetic drive to kind of, you know, make this work. So I think there's quite a lot of uh, developments and really like that uh, kind of, you know, approach and the analogy you explained. So guys, any more questions? Anyone has any more questions? Uh, okay, another question we have here. Last question, uh, Peter. Uh, how can we train on technical aspect of vagal nerve stimulation, user technology or equipment? Uh, any uh, comments on that. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, you you can come to me offline and I'll talk to you about that. Um, but it is really pretty, uh, not very technical for the, what we're using now for most of the vagal nerve stimulation. It's a little device. You place it over the neck with a little bit of conducting gel, turn it on. Uh, we have to train our patients on how to do it. It doesn't require an implant. It doesn't require surgery anymore. Uh, and I'll, I'll, refer you to some videos uh, that are up on the web on how to take a look at that. Um, uh, Electricore.com has a video. If you just look at that, it'll show you basically what's involved. E-L-E-C-T-R-O-C-O-R-E, -E -E, Electrocore.com, and you can find videos on it. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Peter. I really appreciate you giving your time today. Uh, so guys, what we will do is actually, as I said, I will be putting up the recordings. Few people joined late. I will put up the recording on the YouTube channel and also on our Facebook page of Pain Talks. And also in regards to uh, uh, his upcoming webinar, I will be putting the QR code with the, I've taken a snapshot of the, of the, of the uh, uh, slide, which I'll put up. And so do register. I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a very a kind of a great technology and also vagal nerve stimulation field. I would say it's a field now. It's a, it's a field which has many, many applications and we have to watch out for the space. And I'm sure I will look forward to read your next book on the vagal nerve stimulation, uh, Peter, and all the very best with that. I'm sure it will be another great, uh, great hit. So thank you so much. Uh, okay, guys, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next week again on uh, Sunday, 5 p.m. UAE time, 2 p.m. UK time on uh, uh, neurolysis of the joints. Uh, are we there yet with uh, from Dr. Tony NG? Thank you, Peter. Thanks a lot once again. Uh, appreciate. And uh, I'll get in touch with you soon. Okay, take care. Bye-bye now. Yes, thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye.